He was an intergalactic soldier who gets stranded on Earth and meets a beautiful girl while trying to find a way back to his planet. Our story starts with Leto who is a young but experienced soldier for humanity in a world where mankind has conquered galaxies and created a utopia named Avalon under the rule of the Galactic Alliance of Humankind. However, humanity has one last challenge of defeating the alien civilization Hydaws who are their last remaining enemies. Leto is sent on a do-or-die mission to destroy a Hydaz superweapon, which ultimately fails and forces Colonel Kugel to issue a retreat order. However, Leto's machine-caliber mecha is intercepted by a Hydaz, causing him to get detached from the mothership and get stranded in space. Luckily, he survives without a scratch and awakens from hibernation six months later to find himself in his machine-caliber mecha in an unknown place with unknown people speaking an unknown language. His AI assistant named Chamber suggests the Dumbasses who are trying but failing to tamper with his machine caliber are rogue drifters who didn't join the Galactic Alliance of Humankind and urges him to make a decision about their situation. He decides their best course of action is to wait until no one's around to make his next move. Hours pass until the last repair guy. Pinion finally gives up on trying to figure the mecha out and leaves. Leto comes out of the machine caliber and notices how ancient everything looks. Chamber informs him that all environmental conditions are suitable for human life, after which Leto takes his helmet off. Suddenly, the door opens, forcing Leto to hide. Pinion is back with a cute chick named Amy who is excited to see the mysterious Mecha with her own eyes. However, he notices a leak near the giant robot that wasn't there before and immediately grabs a wrench to fight. Leto emerges from the Mecha, takes Amy hostage, and points a gun at Pinion. He tells Pinion to do something, but Pinion can't understand his strange language and runs toward him, prompting Leto to fire his laser gun at Pinion's feet and run away with Amy. Pinion frantically presses the emergency button, waking the rest of the base up. Meanwhile, Leto runs all around the area to give Chamber an idea of the layout. Amy struggles to escape while yelling at him to let her go, which Chamber uses to run his complex algorithms to translate their language. While running around, Chamber states that all evidence points to these people not being drifters because the base seems too primitive to be pressurized and adjusted to proper gravity. Leto opens one of the doors and is led to the outside where he sees they're completely surrounded by water as far as the eye can see. Suddenly, a squirrel attacks his face, which causes him to throw Amy aside out of surprise. He tries to capture her again after recovering but realizes he is surrounded by multiple guns. On his command, Machine Caliber appears behind him, and Chamber reports they're on a planet with a breathable atmosphere. This can only mean one thing, they're on planet Earth of the solar system, where humans originated from and whose existence today has been cast in shadow until now. The others pee their pants on seeing the live mecha and quickly deploy their Walmart versions. Leto orders Chamber to declare in their foreign language that he is not an enemy, and they should lower their weapons. A woman boldly approaches them and introduces herself as Rigid, aide to the commander of this fleet. Chamber assures them Leto is a fellow human, invites them to join the Galactic Alliance, and requests a dialogue with them. Bridget asks the pilot inside the mecha to come out, but Chamber tells them there's no one inside. Bridget moves aside to discuss with her crew members and higher-ups. Amy reports that she didn't sense hostility from Leto and recommends they talk to him. However, the others are still afraid and insist it's better to disassemble the mecha and force the pilot hiding inside to come out. Finally, Commander Fairlock decides against this as it's too risky to make these humans, who are clearly much more advanced, their enemies. Meanwhile, Leto maintains a stalemate in the same spot he was surrounded while Chamber seems a bit too eager to shoot some humans up. Leto keeps his eyes bloodthirst at bay and instructs him to make it his priority to make contact with the Galactic Alliance and determine their location. According to Leto, it's crucial for the Alliance to know of Earth's existence because it was thought to have been completely frozen by the Sun's unusual activity when, in reality, it is perfect for human habitation. Elsewhere, Amy excitedly returns home to tell her little brother Bevel all about her abduction by the hot foreigner Leto. She gives him a small gear she stole from the Mecha as a gift, which he happily uses as a ship wheel to complete one of his models. Bevel recounts the stories they read about humans escaping Earth when it froze and guesses that Leto is one of those humans from outer space. Amy finds this hard to believe and wonders why they'd bother returning. Later that evening, she volunteers to be the one to relay the fleet's negotiations to Leto. He cautiously approaches with his gun pointing to the sky. She takes out a cooked fish from her bag and shoves it in his face. Chamber explains to a confused Leto that she appears to be showing a marine creature's carcass. Amy splits the fish in half and eats it, extending the other half to him again. 
Leto is completely turned off by this woman who just ate a carcass, but Chamber tells him it's a food offering meant as a sign of friendship. He hesitantly eats it, causing everyone watching this exchange to sigh in relief. Amy smiles and asks where they've come from. He simply points to the sky which makes her realize that Bevel was right after all. They sit down and continue the dialogue with Chamber translating for Leto. After they explain the whole Avalon and Hydaw's story, Amy asks the pilot, who has been speaking and getting better at her language, to show his face. However, Chamber explains there's no one inside and opens the hatch to show her. She can't believe her eyes and gets super excited to learn even more about Leto's futuristic society. She explains that their historical records claim Earth was a planet of ice, but the ice gradually melted to cover the planet with a vast ocean. Now, humans on Earth live on connected ships called fleets like the one they're on which is called Gargantia. They scavenge the bottom of the seafloor for old ships and resources to get by and follow galaxy currents, which are glowing stretches of the ocean illuminated by marine bugs that store electricity, which they use to power their ships. Although the beauty of the galaxy currents strikes Leto, he feels stressed because Chamber continues to have difficulty as getting their coordinates. The next day, Amy tries to convince the higher-ups to form an alliance with Leto's side but fails. The commander authorizes an excavation of the underwater area where they found the machine caliber mecha for any suspicious objects. However, this is interrupted by a surprise pirate attack. Bellows, leader of the excavators, is sent to the front lines to defend the fleet, but her team is overwhelmed by the enemy who has aerial units called kites. Amy requests Leto to help them, which he agrees to with the intent of using it as a bargaining chip later on. He boards the machine caliber and launches his swift attack that one shots every pirate ship instantly. Everybody freezes out of horror from seeing the huge wreckage. Leto returns to the fleet to report that he has destroyed all the enemy pirates. He expects everybody to cheer, but instead, Amy looks upset and runs away, while Chamber and Leto wonder what possibly they could have done wrong. The ugly old higher-ups worry that Leto's drastic actions could spark a war between them and the pirates. The commander shuts them up and decides it's best to wait and see how the pirates react before doing anything. After the meeting, Bellows consoles Amy, who is disturbed by Leto's actions, and brings her along to talk to him. Amy apologizes to him for running off before, and Bellows offers him a chicken carcass as a peace offering. Leto is so troubled that he considers starting a genocide on them after all but ultimately sits down with them to discuss the pirate affair. He doesn't find anything wrong with the fact that he vaporized the pirates because they were Gargantia's enemies, but Bellows explains that killing is the biggest taboo on earth, and they only kill enough fish and birds to keep themselves alive. Leto asks why they are armed with weapons if that's the case, to which she answers that they only keep it as self-defense against the pirates and neither party ends up killing the other unless it's the last resort. However, now that blood has been spilled, the pirates will surely retaliate. She requests Leto to lend his power to help them keep the pirates at bay and gives him a dodgy-looking communicator to contact her. Once Bellows makes her leave, Amy thanks him for protecting their fleet and tries to make a move on him by inviting him to stay here forever. He's disgusted by the thought but says he'll consider it to keep the peace. The next day, a huge fleet bearing a lobster crest sails toward Gargantia, which can only mean one thing. Lady Rackage of the Pirates is leading the attack, and her fleet is double Gargantia's size. The higher-ups consider negotiating, but Commander Fairlock knows talking is pointless when they've come for revenge. A silence spreads in the room until Bellows suggests they talk to Leto and switches on the communicator. Bridget speaks to him on behalf of the commander and asks him why he's willing to help them if he can destroy their fleet single-handedly. Leto answers that he will defeat the pirates in exchange for negotiation and the right to stay with them until he figures out what to do. After hearing this, the commander agrees to accept his terms. They immediately start preparing for the upcoming attack before the pirates reach them in the evening. They plan to make Leto and his machine caliber act as a diversion to draw the pirates' attention away from Gargantia's attack. Once the sun fully sets, Leto sneaks up to the pirate fleet in the darkness and shines a blinding light from the machine caliber. All the pirate ships aim fire at the mecha, which it easily dodges. While they're distracted, Gargantia's ships begin firing at the enemy, but the diversion doesn't last long, and the pirates return their focus on the fleet. Three out of fifteen of Gargantia's ships are out of commission within a minute of the battle, forcing Leto to rejoin the fight. With Chamber's help, he destroys several of their weapons and engines without causing any casualties. Meanwhile, Gargantia's main ship is hit by a surprise attack by the pirates, who cleverly deploy several mechas from an underwater ship. 
The troops have their hands full with holding the enemy mechas back, when suddenly a huge lobster-shaped mecha piloted by Lady Rackage is seen surfing toward the fleet. An attack ship tries to shoot it down, but she avoids the trouble altogether by jumping over it. She zooms ahead, crashes into the hull of the main ship, and uses her main mechanical body to climb up the floating fortress. The commander orders everyone else to evacuate because she's only after him, but Leto tackles her from behind before she can reach him. He expects her to push him aside, but she instead holds onto him so that he can't move. Soon, her two minions arrive on small speedboats and clamp onto Leto and Lady Rackage to take them back to the pirate base. However, Leto uses his superior aerial technology to drag them all up in the air and orders them to surrender immediately. When they don't concede, he spins them around in the air like a ferris wheel in hell and keeps telling them to surrender. Lady Rackage knows she's been beaten, but she chooses death over surrender. The rest of the pirates retreat out of fear immediately after seeing their leader defeated, and Gargantia's civilians celebrate their victory. This time, Leto is welcomed by a cheering audience and Amy, who gifts him a bunch of fresh fish. He takes his helmet off and speaks his first word in their language, thank you. Once the celebrations settle down, Rigid talks to Leto about his living situation. He's given a crappy rundown boat as his new home, but he accepts because it's close to chamber. Then she slaps him with a college student loan level receipt, saying that he has to work for Gargantia until he can pay for the damage he caused to the hangar. As time passes, Leto slowly starts learning more of the language and helps the Gargantia crew with daily labor. However, his contributions cause more problems than help, so the workers let him off the hook after he hands them control over the machine caliber. Amy comes to talk to him when he sits sulkily in a shaded corner. She notices him making holes in a white object with his laser gun and asks him what he's making, to which he answers he doesn't know, but he just has a habit of doing this to all his hide-ons claws. He gives one to her, and Amy gratefully accepts it and takes him for a walk. While they walk through the crowded markets, Amy tells him her little brother Bevel will love the Hydaz Claw. The word little brother is foreign to Leto, and he asks Chamber what it means. Amy quickly realizes he has no idea what a family is and asks if he has anyone waiting for him at Avalon. He explains with a completely straight face that he doesn't, and he prefers it that way because families sound inefficient and unnecessary. Good thing Amy's type is walking red flags. She first takes him to Dr. Ordem, the most knowledgeable person in the fleet, to have his questions answered. However, the doctor ends up pretty useless because his library doesn't have the info Leto needs to figure out interstellar travel. Leto then asks a question that has bothered him for a while. Why does the fleet have such an unorganized and inefficient structure where there is no clear chain of command and the weak are protected? Dr. Ordem laughs at this question and advises him to ask Bevel about this, and it'll be Leto's choice to think of his answer as useful or not. After his visit to the dock, Amy takes him to her house to meet Bevel, who is sitting on his bed overlooking the window. Leto learns that he is bedridden because of a chronic chest disease but is very interested in learning about space. He gets hyped when he hears Chamber speak through his transmitter and starts asking about life in space. Leto explains that everyone's main task in the Galactic Alliance is to defeat the Hydaws, who threaten the existence of humankind. Bevel asks if they ever get tired, to which Leto answers that those who get tired die. Life in space doesn't sound as appealing to Bevel anymore, so he asks Leto how well he's adjusting to Gargantia. Leto has his own frustrations with Gargantia and repeats the question he asked Dr. Ordem to Bevel. Bevel points out that Gargantia isn't an organization, it's just a society of people who've decided to help each other out and live in harmony. This sounds absurd to Leto, who doesn't see any purpose in a life like this. He says that people like Bevel, incapable of combat, are immediately weeded out from the Alliance. Bevel asks what the Galactic Alliance will do when they defeat the Hydaas. Leto answers that he will be on standby until he gets his next orders. Bevel points out that being on standby is basically the same as living on, and that's what the people of Gargantia are doing. A few days later, it starts raining unexpectedly. Everybody scrambles onto the streets and spreads sailcloths to collect the rainwater into large barrels. Bellows explains that rainwater is their only source of fresh water, and so it is a community tradition to gather and collect the precious but rare commodity. Leto and Chamber help out as well, and the sight of everyone working together happily seems to stir something inside him. After it stops raining, Amy takes him to her home to dry off but Bevel butts in as a third wheel. This time, he tells Leto that even though he's sick for life, he doesn't think he's unneeded because his sister Amy needs him the same way he needs Amy. Leto gets flustered for a moment because he realizes there isn't anyone who needs him, but sticks to his belief that the Alliance only thinks of those who are capable of fighting as needed. 
That's when Bevel takes out the Hydaw's claw Amy gave him and asks him why he made a flute from the claw because it'd be useless in battle. He then plays a short melody on the flute, which immediately transports Leto to a cold and unwelcoming place where the only warmth is a smiling kid who looks like him. He snaps out of the trance once Bevel stops playing but is shocked to see tears run down his face. He doesn't understand what happened and quickly wipes his face while Bevel apologizes for making him remember something unpleasant and gives him back the flute. Over the next few days, Leto makes more flutes aimlessly while brooding over his conversations with Bezel as he has nothing else to do. He slowly gets frustrated over all his free time and asks Amy to help him find a job he can do. They practically search the entire fleet for job openings, but everything turns out to be a bust. This failing search is interrupted by a sudden halt of the fleet, which makes Leto think they're in a crisis. However, Pinion tells him to get excited because it's his first calm and invites him to his secret party. They meet up with Amy and Bevel, who is suddenly not too sick to party. Bevel explains that a calm is when the ship's engines are shut down due to the winds dying off, and the day is used to carry out maintenance of the ship. For most people, it's a much-needed break from their regular jobs. The party gets off to a rough start because there's a delay in the power returning, making the electric grill useless for cooking the delicious meat. Leto tries to help by making his machine-caliber grill the steak with a heat pulse, but it's too strong to do anything but incinerate the food. Instead, Pinion sends him to a shady granny's house to get something important. Leto experiences the scarier parts of the town while tracking down the granny's address, which takes up half of the day. When he gets there, the granny reads Pinion's note and quietly gives him a box that he's too creeped out to open. When he finally returns to the party, a cheerful crowd has already gathered and started cooking the steaks on machine caliber's black parts, which heat up under the hot afternoon sun. Pinion opens the box to reveal a bottle containing the best sauce in Gargantia. This limes up the party to another level and makes it a huge success. By the end of the day, everybody thanks Leto for his noble service of getting the legendary granny sauce, making him feel good for being useful to others. The next day, Leto cluelessly stares at the money he earned as his salary for the loading work Machine Caliber does daily. Since there's no money in space, he has no idea how to use it. Amy gets him a job as a fisherman due to the surge in fish catch that week. His boss explains that every now and then, galaxy currents converge to form a galaxy loop within which there's always a treasure trove of fish. At first, Leto appears to be a natural at controlling the fishing mecha's movements but quickly fumbles the bag when he dives into the water because he doesn't know how to make it swim and isn't used to not having a valuable tool-like chamber to guide him. Ultimately, he gives up and lets Chamber do the job with machine caliber. He makes another flute as a coping mechanism when Pinion invites him to a fancy dinner. However, he is disappointed when he hears Leto just wants to order a simple sea mustard bread and orders him one of the specials instead. He asks Leto how his life is at Gargantia, to which he responds that it's decent, but he feels a distance between him and the locals. Pinion explains that it's to be expected because the people here don't understand him. Leto doesn't seem to understand, so he asks him if there's anything he wants to do. Leto immediately answers that he wants to continue serving the Alliance, but when asked if there's something he wants to do here, he comes up blank. Pinion points out that that's the exact problem because people can't trust those who don't know what they want. He gives Leto an offer to work with him as a scavenger, but Leto says that he already has a salary that he doesn't know what to do with. Pinion encourages him to use that money to have fun, eat good food like he's having now, and buy things that make him happy, all the while figuring out what he wants to do. At the same time, Bellows appears and persuades him to learn scavenging under her, which starts a bidding war between her and Pinion to recruit him. In the middle of their argument, Chamber sends an emergency assistance request to Leto, who gets there to find that Chamber totally overdid his fish-catching job and turned the fish into mints. To compensate for the damages, Leto pilots the machine caliber this time, and with the help of some local mechas, he executes the biggest fish catch in Gargantia. Leto treats Amy with his newly earned big fat check and gifts Bevel some candy and a crab toy. Dr. Ordram, who is there when he visits their house, tells him the money he earned proves he supported someone. This makes Leto realize the value of a job and get interested in becoming a scavenger. He accepts Bello's offer, and on his first training day, she takes him along to investigate an old ship wreckage. Everything seems to be going well until he detects some unusual movements inside the ship. He immediately protects Bellows when an octopus-like creature bursts out of the wreck. Chamber confirms it is a Hydaz, prompting Leto to snap back into his combat mode and pursue the alien. Bellows yells at him not to lay a hand on the creature, calling it a whale squid. 
However, Leto ignores her and tries to shoot a cannon but misses. The beast pushes against the machine caliber, creating a current that pushes Bellow's mecha to the ocean floor. The Hydaz wraps its tentacles around the mecha's limbs, forcing her to eject. Leto fires at the monster with laser beams and grabs it from behind to squeeze it until it dies. It doesn't take long after the pair return to the fleet for a crowd to gather around Leto's machine caliber. Everybody watches in awe and disgust at the bloody remains of the whale squid on his mecha, and the news spreads fast to the higher-ups, who start condemning Leto because whale squids are sacred creatures to Gargantia, and he just killed one in cold blood. Rigid tries to calm them down but worries about the civilians turning on him and stirring a mass panic that the kill will cast a curse on them. Hinian immediately jumps on this rare opportunity to convince his men to scavenge a whale squid's territory by claiming that someone told him that their nests are always full of treasure. However, the men are too scared to mess with the frightening beasts and refuse to participate unless Pinion can get Leto and his machine caliber to protect them during the operation. Meanwhile, Leto is oblivious to the scandal he has caused and uses some of the blood to run a DNA analysis of the creature to confirm that Hydazes have infiltrated Earth. He also decides to dig for information about their distribution to figure out the extent of the deep shit they're in. Soon, he and Bellows get summoned by Richard, who yells at Bellows for not controlling the situation when she was in charge of Leto. She accepts responsibility for the incident and apologizes for not telling him about the whale squids beforehand. Leto realizes the Hydaws are in great numbers on Earth and pledges to annihilate them all, which pisses off Rigid even more. She tells him that killing the whale squids is a sin in Gargantia, but he stubbornly sticks to his principle that the Hydaws are purely evil creatures that threaten mankind. One of the higher-ups, named Flange, breaks up the fight by telling Rigid that the commander is waiting to hear the details of the incident. Once everyone leaves the room, Pinion grabs hold of Flange and whispers something to him. However, both Bellows and Rigid notice this sus interaction. After the meeting, Amy takes Leto to her house where he asks Bevel to tell him everything he knows about the whale squids. Bevel and Amy try to talk him out of his genocidal idea by saying that the whale squids only get aggressive if anyone tries to attack them but are otherwise gentle creatures. Leto angrily explains that they only ignore Gargantia's people because their civilization is too primitive. But when the time comes, the Hydaws will attack and they'll be in no position to fight back because they have no plan. Bevel and Amy still can't accept his words, so he tells them he only lives to kill Hyaz and leaves. Meanwhile, Bellows confronts Pinion and tells him not to pull his stupid plan of using Leto to raid a whale squid nest and put Gargantia's safety at risk. She calls him out for his clearly childish motives of inflating his ego by being the first to do something daring. This ticks him off but he calms himself down and tells her his true motives are to avenge his brother. She sympathizes with him but still says that his goal is a pipe dream. Meanwhile, Leto shares his frustrations with Chamber and grows impatient with their inability to contact the Galactic Alliance. Chamber confirms that the DNA matches perfectly with the Hydaws, further fueling his angst. Chamber points out that the people in Gargantia don't accept Leto's beliefs because their philosophy fundamentally differs from that of the Alliance. When Leto asks what it is, he answers that the words to describe it don't exist in the Alliance's language. But on Earth, they are coexistence and mutual prosperity. Later that evening, a huge shoal of whale squids is seen fast approaching the fleet, and Leto is notified by Chamber not long after. He immediately charges toward his machine caliber, but Amy gets there in time and tells him to stop. The fleet's control room is in shambles after detecting such a huge shoal coming straight for their ships on shallow waters, and an emergency siren blares through the whole of Gargantia to alert civilians. Commander Fairlock enters the control room and orders them to stop the siren. After a hush falls over the fleet, the commander addresses everyone and tells them to remain calm. He assures them that he has a plan to make sure no harm befalls Gargantia and requests all civilians to make as little noise as possible. He orders Rigid to make sure every ship's engine and power supply are stopped so that there is no light and noise coming from the fleet. As the power shuts down, Amy struggles to hold Leto back. He urges her to let him fight alone and promises to leave Gargantia after he fulfills his purpose. Rigid and her men appear on the scene with their guns pointed at him. She gives him the authority to act as he wishes if the whale squids attack the fleet. But as long as they don't, he must follow their orders. At that moment, the shoal intercepts the fleet and hundreds of whale squids swim past the ships. Everybody maintains pin drop silence as the terrifying shadows loom under the fleet, and eventually, the shoal passes without incident. Amy sighs with relief and touches Leto's shoulder, but he snaps and says he can't remain here if he wishes to carry out his duty as a soldier. 
The next day, Pinion approaches the commander with the proposal of scavenging a whale squid's nest with Leto's help and presents a list of names of ships that have agreed to accompany him on his expedition. Flange backs him up and states that all his ships will join the mission as well because he also wants to benefit from the vast treasures left behind on the seabed by the advanced civilization that used to inhabit Earth. This comes as a huge blow to the commander as Flange owns a major portion of the ships, and his exit would mean a significant nerf on Garganch's defense line. He is about to reject the proposal but stops mid-sentence because of a sudden heart attack. Meanwhile, Chamber informs Leto that he has finally found the coordinates of the Alliance, but rescue is impossible because the time it would take for the Alliance to receive any of his messages is over 6,000 years. At that moment, Leto realizes he will never return to the Galactic Alliance. Over at Dr. Ordram's clinic, Commander Fairlock only regains consciousness long enough to give a mysterious key and hand his title of commander over to Rigid who tearfully grasps his hand as he passes away. The late commander's decision is met with a lot of disapproval by the old and ugly higher-ups, who can't stand the thought of being led by a young woman. As a result, they oppose her request to discuss Flange's proposal of splitting from the fleet during the funeral, and she fails to stop Flange from leaving. Only one of the Baldies named Crone stays back to tell her to keep her head up. The long process of disconnecting the ships begins and the civilians are made to choose between staying in Gargantia or joining Flange's ship. Pinion approaches Leto and strikes a deal where Leto gets to kill all the whale squids living in one of their nests, and Pinion loots the treasures found there. Everybody gathers to perform the last rites of Commander Fairlock, where they pay their respects by sprinkling sand on his body. During the ceremony, Flange tells Crone that he thinks the next commander should have been him. However, Crone shares that he thinks the best use of the little remaining time he has alive is to guide the next generation. Flange wishes him the best of luck, and they say goodbye to Fairlock one last time. Bridget grieves alone the death of the man who raised her after her father, who was the commander before Fairlock died. Pinion comes to her with a final request to sign his proposal but sticks to his decision to leave despite her refusal, saying that she shouldn't stop others from leaving the fleet if she doesn't believe she can protect it. As the ships start trickling out that night, Amy sadly watches Leto getting ready to leave from a distance. One of her friends advises her to join him because it's clear she doesn't want to leave him, but she ultimately decides to stay for Bevel. Bellows enters Rigid's office to see her stressing alone in the dimly lit room. When she tells her to take a break, Rigid snaps and says she can't afford to look weak. Bellows shares that she went through a similar phase when she inherited her father's business, and she felt she had to prove herself by doing everything on her own. After a lot of hard work, she made a huge catch, but her mecha got stuck underwater, and she almost died. Pinion later made fun of her and told her that her actions were dumb because they were the same as not trusting her comrades. She assures Rigid that she's been trained to be commander for ages under Fairlock's guidance, and she should continue to carry out her convictions like always. Rigid sees some lights come to life on the fleet's map, and she looks outside the window to see some people move into the fleet, showing that some people still trust her to keep them safe. Once Amy returns home, Bevel rubs some salt in her wounds by reminding her that Leto's gone. She ends up breaking down and crying over how stupid he is for always risking his life and how she wishes he'd live for himself. Seeing her sister cry spurs Bevel into action, and he goes to talk to Leto. He asks Leto if leaving the fleet is what he really wants, to which Leto answers that he's doing it for humanity and Amy's sake. Bevel counters that Amy never asked him to do that. Leto gives him a flute, saying that it was made by a child who he now thinks was his little brother. He repeats that children like Bevel, who cannot fight, die in the Galactic Alliance, but he doesn't want the same thing to happen on Earth and cause Amy to experience losing her brother, so he will personally destroy all the Hydaws on Earth before they have the chance of attacking. Over at the funeral, Rigid arrives just before they're about to surrender Fairlock's body to the deep ocean. She apologizes to everyone for her tardiness and pours sand on him before saying goodbye. She and the people of Gargantia watch his body sink in silence, after which she turns around to address everyone. She formally introduces herself as their new commander and states her intention to continue Fairlock's wish of protecting Gargantia. She admits her helplessness in stopping so many from leaving the fleet that should be their home and asks the remaining people to give her their support. An uncomfortable silence engulfs the scene and Bellows is about to be the first one to voice her support when she is interrupted by the fisherman chief, who says all the veterans are on her side. Everybody else agrees and cheers for Rigid. The next morning, Leto visits Amy and Bevel in their home and bids farewell. Bevel begs him to return to Gargantia alive because he's keeping the flute safe for him. Leto wishes them well and departs with the last ship. 
Bridget finally signs Pinion's proposal, making it her first official decision as commander. The ships make it safely to the Sea of Fog, which is the stretch of ocean believed to be the biggest whale squid nest from which no one has returned alive. Pinion recalls the time he tried to loot a whale squid nest with his brother, but things went terribly wrong and he saw his brother die in the hands of those marine monsters. However, he is determined to succeed this time and confidently leads his men into the thick fog. They are immediately attacked by whale squids but Leto faces them with his machine caliber. Luckily, the Earthian Hydaws are much weaker than the ones found in space, making it easy for him to kill all the threats. Everything works out swimmingly at first, but the Hydaws' numbers keep increasing as he ventures closer to the nest. At the same time, Chamber warns him about the machine caliber's quickly diminishing power due to its inefficiency underwater. Eventually, he gets so outnumbered that it's impossible for him to strike them all down, so he lures them away from the nest to give the scavengers an opening to begin their mission. On receiving his signal, Pinion's men release barrels of explosives into the nest to destroy all Hydaws within the range, and Leto protects himself with an anti-shock shield. The first blast kills over half of the beasts, causing them to begin retreating to their base. Leto pursues them but gets intercepted by a gigantic Hydaws. Chamber recommends retreating in order to recharge, but Leto decides to carry on. Dozens of smaller Hydaws surround his mecha, and the giant one tries to devour him but he quickly rips through their soft bodies and proceeds to annihilate the rest of the enemy. He explores the deeper parts of the nest and encounters small glowing creatures attached to different surfaces. Chamber guesses this is the first ever instance of seeing the young forms of Hydaws. Leto hesitates at first but proceeds to wipe them out as well. Eventually, he reaches a vast chamber in the nest, which appears to have been an administrative block of whatever building this was. It is littered with an uncountable number of recording devices that Chamber scans for data only to discover that accessing the contents is forbidden by the Galactic Alliance. All he can tell Leto is that it is confirmed that these ruins were a research facility of Earth's ancient civilization. He overturns Chamber's decision not to share the data by pointing out that in situations where contacting the main force is not possible, the highest commanding officer, which is Leto in this case, calls the shots. The data turns out to be hours of footage of the major historical events in the last chapter of Earth's previous civilization. As humanity faced the threat of a global ice age, different factions rose to face the problem of ensuring mankind's continued prosperity. One such faction was the Evolvers who used advancements in biology and engineering to genetically modify humans to make them more suitable to find a new planet to make home. These genetically engineered humans were created with zero regard for international regulations and were designed to have very long lives and to withstand the harsh conditions of vacuum and space. The movement leaders stayed strong in their belief that their research was in humanity's best interests and did not stop despite the non-stop protests. However, the Evolvers were met with tremendous backlash never seen before after information on their twisted human experiments leaked, leading to a world war between two sides of humanity that fled Earth during the Ice Age, one being the Evolvers and the other being Continental Union. This same conflict has persisted for centuries and is now known as the war between the Galactic Alliance and the Hydaws. Leto tries to process the discovery that the Hydaws are another line of humans, and the Galactic Alliance has been keeping this information a secret. Chamber assumes that all the records are manipulated by the enemy because it contradicts the information laid down by the Alliance. A juvenile Hydaws swims close to the machine caliber and inspects it with curiosity. Chamber locks onto it as a target and proceeds to kill it despite Leto's protest, causing him to scream from despair. Back in Gargantia, Bevel prays for Leto's safety by playing the Hydaws claw flute, which causes Amy to cry. Leto returns to the ship and reports to Pinion that all the Hydaws have been exterminated. The scavengers cheer and prepare to loot enough treasure to make them rich beyond their wildest dreams. Feeling hollow, Leto exits his machine caliber and takes his helmet off to see all the Hydaws blood on his mecha's hands. He tries to pull himself together, but the visions of him crushing all the Hydaws flash before his eyes. He ends up imagining killing one of the young ones, which had the face of his little brother, causing him to throw up. Meanwhile, the scavengers start collecting the precious remains of the ancient civilization quickly forming a tall heap of priceless items. Pinion and Flange admire the trinkets, which haven't got an inch of rust despite being underwater for centuries. Flange is excited to bring this material back home to help develop mankind, but Pinion selfishly wants to hoard the material for themselves. He broadcasts a message to all the ships in the area that they've defeated the whale squids in the Sea of Fog and obtained all the treasure with it. 
Kirby egoistically announces that he will be known as Pinion of the Sea of Fog from now on, and anyone who dares to try and take his treasure away will be sunk by his fleet. Flange is powerless to stop this development because most of the men on his ships change their allegiance to Pinion. Besides, they will not be able to properly utilize any of the scavenged materials if they lose Pinion's skills as a mechanic. Pinion yells at Leto for not helping with the scavenging anymore, but Leto refuses to participate no matter what. Back in Gargantia, the higher-ups report to Commander Rigid about the broadcasts. She doesn't think any action is necessary until it is confirmed that what Pinion said was true. When asked about deserters, she decides she will respect all those who decide to leave after hearing the rumors. Bevel and Dr. Ordem are beyond disappointed to hear that Leto destroyed the biggest whale squid nest and Amy cries alone as always. In the Sea of Fog, Pinion turns out to be a ruthless leader who doesn't stop attacking until the approaching pirate ships surrender. This leads to a brutal battle until the scavengers successfully repair one of their treasures, a super powerful cannon from the ancient human civilization. One shot from that tank prompts the pirates to immediately cease fire and surrender their ships and men to the fleet, instantly growing Pinion's fleet even more. He approaches Leto once more to ask for Machine Calibre's help inspecting some of the scavenged treasure. Leto doesn't seem to hear what he's saying but allows it anyway. Pinion drags the zombie version of Leto to the deck, where everyone is feasting on the occasion of their victory. They start hooting and cheering as soon as they see Leto and Machine Calibre. Pinion hypes the pair's accomplishments even further and joins the party. Leto completely dissociates from his surroundings and wonders how he got to where he is and what exact point in his life sealed his fate. He resigns himself to simply making more flutes. Later, Chamber inspects one of the unidentifiable scavenged items and identifies it as a primitive version of the beam weapons the machine caliber carries. Despite its primitive form, he estimates it has almost a hundred times the firepower of the whole fleet, and with the right repairs, it can be returned to its original working condition. Things can't be going better for Pinion, and he runs to tell Leto. Meanwhile, Leto is still in the middle of his meltdown. Chamber reports to him that he found evidence corroborating the footage they found in the Hydaw's nest. The electricity-producing light bugs found on the galaxy currents are actually nanomachines found on the exoskeleton of the Hydaws, designed to absorb electromagnetic waves like light and convert them to energy in a process similar to photosynthesis. This matches the description found in the Evolver's footage that lists the features of the genetically modified human beings, confirming the link between them and the Hydaws. This completely destroys Leto's lifelong resolve to fight the Hydaws because he is now burdened with the knowledge that they are simply evolved humans. However, Chamber states that he ran his own analyzes on the available data and reached the same conclusion that Galactic Alliance did. He asserts that humans and the Hydaws cannot coexist because the latter does not need civilization. This is because the Hydaws have evolved to have resilient bodies that overcome the physical limitations of the human body, making it unnecessary for them to maximize their intellect and form civilization in order to thrive. On the other hand, humans have no choice but to perfect their knowledge and work together as a unit to overcome their limitations, thus forming two diametrically opposing sides that are bound to fight each other. Leto is speechless after hearing Chamber's thoughts, and before he can arrive at a conclusion, Chamber alerts him of a message from the Alliance. He frantically looks around and notices a familiar-looking machine caliber in the distance, and realizes that Colonel Kugel has shown up. In Gargantia, Amy delivers a message to Bellows, who is with Commander Rigid. They tell her that the galaxy currents appear to be moving toward the Sea of Fog, so they might be able to see what Pinion's fleet is up to. They barely hide their excitement over the possibility of seeing the loved ones they miss again. Meanwhile, Leto can't believe what he's seeing until Kugel establishes contact with him to ask him how he's doing. Colonel Kugel explains that he received Leto's distress signal when he was on the other side of the planet, but couldn't contact him until now because he needed to maintain radio silence. The Colonel is a dear sight for sore eyes, and Leto immediately boards his machine caliber to reach him. At the same time, Pinion's fleet spots the giant shadowed figure in the distance and decides to initiate an attack, believing it's another pirate ship. Once the cannon hits the figure, it retaliates with a powerful laser beam that strikes down the biggest structure in the fleet in an instant. Pinion panics and calls for Leto's help but finds Leto already speeding toward the shadow while announcing his return to the Alliance. As Leto gets closer to Colonel Kugel's ship, he sees a large number of cloaked humans organized into tight groups. He is greeted by one of them and is escorted to a grand room with a dining table. Once he takes a seat, a hologram of Colonel Kugel appears in front of him. 
Pugil explains that he isn't able to meet him in person because he has been affected by an endemic disease, making it impossible for him to leave his sterilized cockpit. Hearing this, Chamber requests Pugil's machine caliber named Striker to transmit details of the disease. Over on Pinion's fleet, people get restless over the sight of the ominous ship with a second traveler from the skies. They receive a message from that ship to send a representative to initiate a dialogue. Initially, Flange argues it should be him, but Pinion reasons that he's the one who caused this mess, and Flange should stay back to keep the fleet together. Pinion waits for the ship that will take him to the dialogue and is surprised to see the surfing lobster Mecha emerge out of the fog. Lady Rackage busts out of the lobster, revealing that she survived the defeat of her pirate battle and now works for Kugel. She escorts him to Kugel's platoon, which noticeably has a gloomy atmosphere to it. Pinion finds it unusual to see starving and poor people on the streets, but Lady Rackage states that it is their god's rule that the weak serve the strong. She adds that the machine caliber is called a thunder giant, one of god's servants that delivers divine judgment. Meanwhile, Kugel states his intentions of training the humans on Earth to join the Galactic Alliance's cause of eradicating the Hydaws. Leto shares that Hydaws are actually humans, but it turns out that the Colonel was already aware of it but he views the Hydaws as former humans who now operate on simple animalistic drives. He adds that even since he took control of the fleet, he's built the society such that the weak and strong support each other in their own ways, thus increasing the well-being of the average citizen. Stryker elaborates that his definition of well-being means maximizing the benefit-to-cost ratio of an individual to maximize their contribution to society. Colonel Kugel invites Leto to help him change the planet but doubt stirs deep within Leto's consciousness. Elsewhere, Rackage escorts Pinion to an empty room and tells him to wait. His ADHD ass doesn't wait one second until he starts fiddling around with a fancy-looking Rubik's Cube. Different parts open up and suddenly, a voice booms out of the tiny box, making Pinion realize it's a transmitter. The voice reveals itself to be Strikers, who congratulates him for passing the test of aptitude and invites him to join the fleet as an engineer officer to put his tech-savvy skills to use and benefit mankind. She promises to provide him with the best training for understanding the mechanisms of their advanced weapons if he agrees to repair and design new ones. Pinion's a simple man, so he agrees as long as she can guarantee the fleet's safety. Striker's hologram disappears and dozens of cloaked people enter through the doors to lay down delicious food and drink on the table. However, he's made to read some document aloud to a microphone before eating, and a man paints the same symbol that everyone has on Pinion's face. His words are broadcasted to the Flange fleet, which essentially instructs them to willfully surrender to the Kugel fleet and obey their commands. Flange knows they stand no chance against Kugel and agree to their terms. A group of the cloaked weirdos board his fleet and declare they will split the ships based on the residents' abilities, completely disregarding the fact that they'll be separating families. Flange tries to oppose this, but he has no power and must give up soon. He kneels before them and is given the blessing of their god in the form of a face painting. Meanwhile, Lady Rackage escorts Pinion to his living quarters. On the way, Pinion notices the area seems more well-off and asks if he's living in the richer section of society. Rackage points out that there's no money here, and rations are given out purely based on one's contribution to the fleet. He looks closer at the people he passes by and realizes they look hollow and dreamless. She tells him his people will be split up into different ships to avoid any incidences of rebellion, causing him to grow wary of this place. Leto boards his machine caliber for a medical examination, making him wonder how Kugel managed to insubordinate an entire fleet inside this cramped space. Chamber points out that confining himself in this massive foreign mecha must have instilled fear in the people and served to enhance his control over them. Leto feels uneasy about the idea of ruling them with fear, but Chamber says it's most logical to do so because it exploits the most basic human emotion to control them and overall promotes peace and order among those who follow his fear-fueled regime. He blabbers on and on about it until Leto tells him to shut up. The next day, Colonel Kugel tells Leto that now that they have two machine calibers, they can execute the first step of his grand plan. Leto prepares to engage in combat against the Hydaws but is startled to see a map of Gat Gancha appear before him. He approaches Stryker in person and urges Kugel not to go through with his plans of attacking Gargancha. However, the Colonel insists they must carry out his plan to recruit willing human resources from Gargancha and restructure the Order of Earth. He convinces Leto that it is their duty to build a second Avalon if they can't unite with the Galactic Alliance and Leto reluctantly agrees. Meanwhile, Pinion begins his first day on the job as an engineering officer. He is taken to the vast armory where all the relics collected from the seafloor that are suspected to be weapons are kept. 
His job is to repair all of them with the help of a cool gadget that lets him see the innards of each relic. As an incentive, he is allowed to keep all the items that won't be useful to the fleet. Pinion is sold the moment he hears that and gets to work. As he scours the endless shelves, Lady Rackage calls him a sellout and urges him to join her rebellion against the Kugel fleet. She reveals she is disgusted by the ways of this place and wishes to sink the fleet and become a pirate again. If he agrees to join the rebellion, he will have to help her obtain Leto's machine caliber. Pinion goes on to continue his repair work on the giant cannon they scavenged when he's approached by one of the original messengers of the Kugel fleet. She delivers an official message and a hidden note to him from Flange. After reading it, he has a secret rendezvous with Flange, who asks him for information about the weird ghostly state of the people in the Kugel fleet. He worries that his people will become like them if they remain here for too long. Pinion shares that Lady Rackage is on the fleet and is planning a revolt, but he can only join her if he gives her Leto's mecha. Meanwhile, Leto mulls over Colonel Kugel's words and recalls his life in Avalon. He is distracted by a squirrel that resembles Amy's pet, which serves as a bitter reminder of Amy waiting for him back in Gargantia. To make matters worse, it begins raining, which reminds him of the time they collected rainwater together. Suddenly, he hears a loud and deep wailing sound coming from the deck so he runs to investigate it. He finds all the cloaked members of the fleet gathered on the harbor and calling in unison with their hands stretched to the sky as if they are in a mass trance-like state. Dozens of wagons are wheeled to the edge, each containing sickly and starving people in straight jackets. They are covered in white hoods while a priestess declares them as noble sacrifices to the gods of the sky, and hundreds of those innocent and weak people are thrown into the ocean. While Pinion watches this horrifying spectacle, Lady Rackage reveals that their next target is Gargantia. He finally makes up his mind to take part in the revolt. At the same time, Leto snaps out of his brainwashed obedience to the Galactic Alliance and decides for himself that he will protect the people of Gargantia. He approaches Chamber to ask him if he can fight Striker, to which he replies that he is unsure of their differences in combat ability but he is capable of considering Striker an opponent because she is operating outside of the Galactic Alliance's orders. Leto likes that answer and prepares to fight his superior, Colonel Kugel. Pinion emerges from the shadows to reveal he and the Rebellion party want to help him in his mission. Leto requests the messenger from the Flange fleet to personally deliver a warning message to Gargancha because they can't risk any radio transmissions being intercepted. She takes the long and treacherous journey through the rainstorm to reach Gargancha but passes out from exhaustion when she can see the fleet on the horizon. Miraculously, Amy spots her and saves her before she plunges into the ocean. Leto's message to Gargantia alerts them of the upcoming attack and tells them to change their course. Commander Ridget also thinks this is the best course of action until Amy bursts into the room and reveals that the messenger told her that Leto plans to fight the Colonel alone. She begs them to help Leto instead of running away like cowards. Everybody hesitates to speak first until Dr. Ordem tells Commander Ridget that they need to have the bravery to make their decision just like Leto did. For this, they should finally make use of the key that the late Commander Fairlock gave Ridget. Over at the Kugel fleet, Colonel Kugel officially declares the beginning of his crusade to introduce a new order to humanity on Earth. However, it is interrupted by Leto who faces him with his machine caliber and openly announces his defiance to Kugel. Kugel reminds him that it is their duty to enlighten the primitive humans on Earth, but Leto counters that they have formed their own way of life, and they have no right to change it. Colonel Kugel is done reasoning with him and initiates combat by shooting laser beam that Leto narrowly dodges. They fly to the skies to shoot their laser beams and missiles at each other, but Leto notices a huge gap in their strength. Chamber guesses Kugel is able to have such an explosive output because he's drawing from an external energy source instead of the usual generator and striker. Leto does his best to dodge striker's beams while Pinion fires a beam at Kugel from the onboard cannon. At the same time, several bombs go off in the fleet, disarming the rest of the weapons. This is followed by a broadcast from Flange who instructs all civilians to take shelter in the cargo hangars. The cloaked lunatics don't take this lying down and try to support their lord by deploying many mechas, but Lady Rackage destroys their attempt with her superior sea lobster mecha. Meanwhile, Leto struggles to gain momentum in his fight with Kugel and suffers damage after colliding with Stryker. He manages an emergency lift off before falling into the ocean and his ass is covered by a perfectly aimed missile at Stryker thanks to Pinion. Leto grabs Stryker at the right opportunity and bashes the mecha into a pillar at full speed. While Stryker tries to recover from the blow, Leto opens Stryker's cockpit to reveal Colonel Kugel was dead all along and his voice was being faked by Stryker this whole time. Stryker pushes Leto and Chamber away and takes off again. 
chamber saves Leto from his fall and they pursue the rogue AI mecha. Stryker claims that although her pilot is long dead, she carries on his will by maintaining this society she has created. She adds that she has taken away the burden of thinking from the common people by making them obey her unconditionally and that Leto should follow suit like he did at the Galactic Alliance. Chamber points out a fatal flaw in her logic, which is that they cannot consider those who abandon their own thinking as human and so their protection no longer falls under their mission. Leto and Chamber join forces to take down Strike and her corrupted ideologies once and for all. Meanwhile, the battle between the Kugel and Flange fleets worsens and Pinion's team begins to lose their momentum. Pinion throws a fit and orders his men to leave the fleet on a boat and leave the rest to him. They realize his tough exterior is just an act and he's merely pushing them away to protect them. He tells them that his will to protect the treasure they scavenged purely comes from a selfish desire to avenge his brother and that he doesn't want to endanger any of their lives for it, so he decisively tells them to get lost. Higher up in the skies, Leto is overwhelmed by Stryker's power and orders the activation of Neuro Plus Power. However, Chamber refuses to authorize it because it's too dangerous to form a neural link between them without proper supervision. Leto convinces Chamber to reconsider because they are the only ones who can stop Stryker from destroying this planet, and since they can never return to the Galactic Alliance, it doesn't matter what happens to them. Finding no logical flaw in his words, Chamber activates the neural link and fuses all his controls to Leto's nervous system, giving him less than 10 minutes to defeat Stryker before his vitals fail. With his newfound power, he collides with Stryker but damages his own mecha in the process. Meanwhile, Commander Ridget uses the key to open the fleet's stairway to heaven, which leads to their most powerful long-range bow that can shoot its arrow beyond the horizon. In the distance, Leto sees the familiar kite flyer of Amy. She calls out to him and tells him that she realized after he left that she wants to be with him no matter what and so he has to return to Gargantia no matter what. Her words reawaken Leto's spirit to fight. Suddenly, a giant explosive destroys part of the Kugel fleet. Upon witnessing the utter destruction, Flange realizes Gargantia is using the stairway to heaven. A second round hits the fleet again, causing considerable damage. Stryker shifts her attention from Leto and changes course toward Gargantia, but Leto is hot on her tail. Lady Rackage orders Pinion to stop being a hero and evacuate the cannon. He begrudgingly agrees, jumps off the cannon on her countdown and gets rescued by her seconds before the stairway to heaven's arrow destroys the cannon. Bridget unleashes one last missile to destroy the Kugel fleet's stronghold and decisively put an end to their battle. Meanwhile, Leto struggles to stop Stryker from reaching Gargantia and the toll of the neural fusion starts getting too heavy for him. Chamber asks for confirmation from him that he's ready to sacrifice his life by continuing the use of Neuro Plus. Leto says he was trained to face death all his life until he met Amy, who taught him how to live. He expresses his wish to hear Amy's voice again and starts crying. Chamber informs him that his current mental state is unfit for a soldier and so he is relieved from his military duties. He authorizes the ejection of Leto from the cockpit without his consent and continues the fight without him, telling him to live on and pursue happiness on Earth. Chamber goes on to tell Stryker to go to hell, grabs her, and fires a beam from his core that incinerates both of them. Leto sees his lifelong AI comrade die before his eyes and makes sure to follow through on his last words to live on. In the aftermath of the victory against Kugel Fleet, Gargantia welcomes Flange's fleet back and slowly bounces back to prosperity. Bevel teaches an archaeology class to all the kids of Gargantia to educate them on mankind's history and their origin. They learn that apart from the Hydaws and Galactic Alliance who fled their Earth after the Ice Age, some humans remained on their home planet and worked hard to bring the sun back and melt the ice covering Earth. As a result, the planet was covered entirely by an ocean that is home to Gargantua on the surface, and the Earthling Hydaws underwater, who are meant to coexist. Leto continues his life on Gargantua as the most successful scavenger who retrieves relics from whale squid's nests without harming them. After each of his adventures, he happily returns to his dear Amy. That's it for this video, make sure to like and subscribe for more and watch this next video on screen.